Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, the, the talk for tonight with a very interesting title, How Much More Can We Discover? Uh, I, I think it is an important subject for all of us who, who, who have an interest in pursuing knowledge uh, and also, I guess, also reflecting on the meaning of life. How much more can we discover? Uh, I'm very honored to have this chance to introduce to you Sir James Mullies, although I think lots of you are fans of Sir James, <laughs> so uh, I, I think uh, he needs no long introduction. So I would just uh, say a few things. Uh, for me, as a member of uh, Morningside College, and I guess also for the Morningsiders here, uh, Sir James always makes us happy because we gather together uh, three times per week for our communal dinner. Uh, so we, we, we'll be seated at the table with all this food and the smell in the air. And so your appetite will be... <laughs> you, 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 you work out your appetite with all this nice smell in the air and all this nice company, but you won't start your meal until Sir James very gracefully and elegantly walks onto the stage and strike the gong, <laughs> artfully. Uh, and, and for us uh, colleagues at the Office of University General Education, uh, Sir James is also a very happy sight to us because we all remember with very fond memory the last time he came to the uh, general education student seminar and he was so supportive of the students who won an award there and he was also supportive of us. He arrived early as he always does and he actually stayed through the whole session of Cantonese presentations. <laughs> because because he, uh, I would only say that in addition to being a very good economist uh, with achievements so great that he won uh, a Nobel Prize, he is also a very good and dedicated educator. And so I guess it's for this reason he, he, he promised to take up this uh, important task of being master of a new college, uh, one of the smallest, but I would say the coziest and I would say the most successful because I'm a morning sider. <laughs> so he take up this very important uh, task and I guess so far morning siders have all been very happy to be in the college and uh, so, so the episode I just related was just one small episode so to show how much he is concerned for his students and I guess morning siders who are here tonight you are doing just the right thing to repay Sir James for being such a caring educator, so you come to support his talk. And of course, I know lots of you come not only for, for supporting, uh, uh, for, for moral support, but also to, to learn something important and to join in this uh, common uh, pursuit, you know, thinking through this problem, very important question for all of us, how much more? can we discover. So, I will now pass the floor to Sir James. Oh, good evening everybody. Thank you very much for coming. At, uh, what for me is a rather unconventional time for giving a lecture. Uh, so it seemed only appropriate to have a rather unconventional subject. Uh, a subject where you may well wonder, even if the question seems interesting, whether the answer could possibly be interesting and whether it's got an answer. Well, we wait and see. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, telling you three different things that uh, kind of motivate me here or illustrate what's going on. The uh, first thing is that in recent years I have uh, seen a lot of reports of Chinese politicians and uh, uh, governors of cities and things like that, mayors, uh, saying it's terribly important now that China should encourage innovation. 
that uh, they've been growing on the basis of the technologies available from the already rich countries. And uh, now it is time that they produce their own innovations because otherwise they're not going to be able to continue growing. Uh, and that certainly raises uh, an interesting question, how uh, successfully they could do that. Now, I'm not going to talk about that question directly, but uh, I think it might be in your minds while I'm going on. Second, this is just something that happened to me and uh, presumably a few other people last year. I got an email, and amongst all the other emails one gets, from uh, some Nobel Prize winners in Europe who uh, wanted me to sign up to a statement which was to go to the European Union in Brussels and uh, say that it was terribly important that they shouldn't now in the midst of all the cuts that are going on cut back on expenditure in science. And, and my first thought was yes, I might very well uh, do that although perhaps it's really for a scientist to do it. But then I read the piece, which is well written, but it seemed to me there wasn't a single argument in the, in the letter that was to go to the EU that was actually uh, in favor of an expansion of expenditure on science. So I, I began to think, well, uh, what could one say? I know it sounds a bit strange to say there were no arguments, but I wasn't going to take time to prove it to you. Uh, but, but of course, I was looking at it as an economist in a way, thinking if you argue in favor of spending money on something, uh, well, two points. One is you've got to be able to show what kind of benefits will follow. And I don't necessarily mean economic benefits, but I mean you've got to provide some evidence that uh, something would follow. And, and secondly, it has to be about uh, what would happen if you spend more. Now you see, that immediately raises the question, uh, and it may very well be the case that scientists are doing a great deal and it's very worthwhile and has proved to be very important and probably will still continue to prove to be very important. But maybe if you had a few more scientists working, that wouldn't add to the pace of the advance of knowledge at all. And I, I got a bit curious to know whether it was possible to say anything about that. My third little anecdote is more of an anecdote, and this was just from a conference I was at at the end of last week, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which happened to hold its fourth annual conference in Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm on the, the advisory board of that institute and I, I rather believe in what it's trying to do. And one of the things it does is that it, it, it's willing to let people outside economics propose to do some research in economics. And one of them was there. We had a session, in fact, on research and development. In fact, they're therefore rather on the sort of topic I'm talking about. Uh, and one of the people was not an economist at all. He was a physicist, rather a distinguished physicist, an Italian physicist, Luciano Pietronero. And he started his remarks by saying, well, um, amongst other things, he, he said that he would found that the economists proved to be very interested in what he was saying and, and so on. He found a good welcome from economists, which I thought was very nice, that we were prepared to, to listen to people from other subjects, which we should, because a lot of the big contributions in economics have come from people who are not economists. But uh, he explained, however, uh, why he was now doing the economics of inventions. Uh, because he said he'd uh, uh, spent quite a lot of time in recent years 
working on uh, uh, particularly superconductivity, which is an important area in physics. And he said there really hasn't been any significant advance for about 10 years. And uh, he, he didn't quite know, the, there wasn't anything very exciting to do. It was, he, was, he didn't use the phrase, but he was clearly saying he was banging his head against the brick wall. Mind you, I looked him up and I find he's already published 400 papers, so don't get the impression that he's been sitting around idly not, not doing anything. But I thought that was an interesting remark, and it's not the only time that I've heard scientists suggest that there's been a stoppage. Of course, many of you have probably heard the, the very commonly said statement that pharmaceutical companies have uh, not recently managed to make any really significant advance in the development of new drugs, perhaps not for over 10 years. Uh, well, ag against, I'm beginning to suggest you see some sort of pessimism in, in the world out there and a, on a very long run view as to what the prospects for science are. But at the same time, Another very striking feature of the world is that there are more and more scientists. The number of scientists is going up very rapidly. There are various ways you can measure what's going on, and I, I wasn't able, in the time I took on the issue, to discover quite how many scientists there are in the world and how it compares with how many there were, say, 10 years ago, but I'm sure it has grown very rapidly. But certainly the number of patents reported on a worldwide basis has gone up very rapidly at about 10% a year for, for a while now and has uh, reached around 2 million. The figure I saw was for 2011 and it hadn't quite made the 2 million but that's, that's quite a lot of patents in, in a year in which uh, patents granted. So in other words they are new ideas that are agreed by some suitable authority to be new ideas. And of course, uh, th those of you who are engaged in research at all are very well aware of the enormous flood of publications in any area, so that it's, uh, it's certainly quite impossible for me to think of keeping up with all of the papers and things I'm interested in, which is partly my fault for being interested in too many things, but it's, uh, but it's also the other people's fault for writing too much. Uh, and uh, there's an awful lot of this going on. And of course there has been rapidly increasing expenditure in research and development. A bit surprising with, uh, in the Western economies, and it has hit Hong Kong a bit. Uh, growth fell off rather badly recently and currently very low indeed in, in Europe, say. Uh, but they, they have in fact kept the expenditure in research and development almost up. So that's staying quite high. So my question is how long can it go on? I'm going to uh, start by talking a little bit about uh, how research actually happens. Now I, of course I know that maybe almost none of you are mathematicians but uh, and a number of you will do mathematics as part of, uh, of your work one way and another. And I'm sure you can uh, get some kind of sense of what might be involved in doing research in mathematics. Uh, of course, the reason I take mathematics as an example to think about and thinking about how knowledge progresses is that in a certain sense that's extremely simple because you can say what mathematics consists of it consists of a lot of symbols written on paper, uh, some of which are letters standing for variables of one kind and another, and some of which are operators that add them together, multiply them, or, or whatever. Uh, so you, you're getting a lot of patterns of, of things, and discoveries in mathematics can quite often be represented by writing down such a series of symbols and say, and asserting it as a truth, uh, a logically correct, deducted, deduced statement. Uh, and uh, if you think of it 
like that, then it would appear at the simplest that the process of doing research in mathematics is going to be following the rules of deduction to take some of these statements and deduce other statements, which will, of course, on the whole, get more and more complicated, longer and longer. Uh, that you may hide the length of these, for example, algebraic formulae by saying, let A be equal to B plus C, or whatever it might be, and then just A appears in the, in the formula, but truly the underlying complication keeps increasing. And on the face of it, you would think that that makes it, well, uh, two things. One is that if you're going to advance the subject, then presumably you better know what has already been deduced. Because what you're going to do is to deduce other truths from truths that are already known. Of course, uh, you might deduce truths from truths that are known to you, but they, they might already be known, so you're not really adding to knowledge if that's what you do. So therefore, it is quite important to, to know what has already been established. And, and since the whole corpus of known mathematical truths keeps increasing in any reasonable sense, then it's going to take any individual longer to find out what is already known. Uh, there is going to be at least one quite obvious consequence of that, that uh, researchers are going to have to specialize more and more. Uh, and another maybe not quite so obvious consequences that they are presumably going to have to find ways of cooperating more effectively than they have tended to do in the past. And uh, you, you, can, you can see uh, all of that in various ways. Uh, I was quite surprised when long ago as a, as a math student, just at the point when I was about to give up doing graduate maths to do graduate economics, that I went to a World Congress of Mathematicians and chatting to some of the people there, discovered that, uh, uh, I wouldn't say that they, they couldn't understand much more than I could, but they could understand very few of the lectures that were being given. Being mathematicians were on the whole quite honest and uh, um, uh, uh, people, they, they assured me that they didn't understand. That there was no, no false modesty about this. Although I wouldn't have been able to search. So that's one consequence. But the, the other aspect that uh, you've got uh, more, you're going to have people working together. Now, you may know that in mathematics, there haven't been a lot of joint jointly produced papers. It's not like these papers you get in physics, which have hundreds of names attached to the, the paper, like when the uh, an announcement that probably the Higgs boson has been identified and its properties found. Okay. Now, I'm not going to be pursu uh, pursuing particularly the, the idea that uh, you're going to do a lot more joint work, but you do get more joint papers now than you used to. When Hardy and Littlewood in Trinity College, Cambridge, was an unusual phenomenon of two mathematicians working together. Although I understand that they spoke to one another rather seldom. Get it right? Oh, good. Okay, nods from the back. This is very important. Uh, I, I'm, insofar as I'll follow this along, I, I just say that the main point is that deduction is bound to get more complex. And you get longer formulae. And that, that, that surely is quite an important feature. But look at something entirely different. Uh, development of the steam engine. 
which is a, 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 a sort of descendant from the Scottish Enlightenment. I like to look at uh, the, this great example of an enormously important invention, the steam engine. Uh, and of course, steam engines, in a sense, had existed before James Watt got busy. And there were many further developments of steam engines after he'd uh, finished. But uh, he worked on this for many years. It took a long time to get one to work. And the primary question was to, to get it work, to work with sufficient efficiency for it really to be worth people spending money on these things. Um, instead of relying on old water mills or, or, or things of that kind. And uh, what was going on, as I understand it, was that he had to try many things. This is very much like the, uh, a not terribly good mathematician trying to get new results by following all possible moves from the formulae he's got in front of him which is indeed very like a chess player, wondering which of various possible uh, steps he would be wise to follow. Uh, so it seems to me that what James Watt was doing was very like that. And uh, the point of all this is to say that he's trying out a lot of the moves that might be made. Of course he can't try out every possible thing. But that, that's not a fully satisfactory account of what's going on. If what I've said so far was the right account of doing research in things like engineering and mathematics and all of the scientific and technological areas that you'd be interested in, then I think I would have a, a pretty pessimistic conclusion, answer to the question that I've uh, set initially because it's clear things are getting more and more complex and it will at some point be impossible for people to handle this increased complexity. Uh, the, the, the things that can be put together in an understandable way will be solved. Or put it another way, or another aspect of it, that the time that it will take people to uh, catch up will get longer and longer. And of course, as it gets longer and longer, people will have less and less time left in their lives. I'll come to this question of the length of life. But, uh, but at least one possible model there is that uh, you have mathematicians eventually feeling they've reached the point when they can try to do research in their 50s. And at that point, they discover that uh, the, the neurons won't work well enough. And uh, that would be the end of mathematics. Uh, of course, uh, like other people, I have met young Russians of 14 or 15, and also some Hong Kong ones, who can do very good mathematics at uh, that age. So we haven't got there yet. But the question is, would it be like that eventually? But there's a sense that that's not entirely right. Uh, one thing is that uh, mathematicians certainly keep inventing devices to allow more complex patterns to be handled with the same degree of simplicity. Uh, they get better notations, they find neat ways of stating theorems, and they invent new concepts. Space-time might be one that would be reasonably familiar to people, that you can just take uh, the three dimensions of space and one of time all as a single entity and think about it as a whole. Though I suspect there are going to be, at each stage, when you invent a new device like that, there are going to be fewer people who can actually handle it. So you can see there's a narrowing, possibly, of the people who could do science, could do mathematics, rather than an expansion. I think we've got these two things going on. Uh, on the one hand, for example, in China, you have more and more people being uh, drawn into the educational system. You find the people who have the ability to do the complicated things. But the things that they're going to have to do have got more complicated. 
So probably the actual absolute number who can do it may not increase. There's another aspect that I can't quite get a grip on properly, that somehow it helps to have a goal towards which you're working. Uh, that, that, that's the way that most scientists would think they were doing. They don't think they're just moving step by step from where they currently are to somewhere else. They don't know where. They have a generalized notion of the direction in which they're moving. It might, in the mathematics case, that can be made very precise because you can state problems like what's the solution to a partial differential equation and uh, then that gives more shape to what you're doing. Similarly, James Watt certainly knew what kind of thing he wanted to, to get out of his inventing in, in a rather general way. So it's this amazing ability of human reasoning to be able to work with not very well-defined things. Uh, it, it's common in discussions of these things amongst economists to take an example like the wheel and say you couldn't possibly have any idea what it would be possible to do once the wheel was invented before the wheel was invented. Um, that doesn't seem to me to be quite right because it, uh, uh, you only have to go back and read Jules Verne or something and, uh, or, or indeed you could go back to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, where it's possible for people to conceive of things flying around. They don't have the details right, but they somehow can create a goal in their mind. And this appears to be a very effective method for getting over <coughs> what the economists would call diminishing returns in the, it with increased complexity, but maybe imperfect. Of course, one thing you can understand if you think of uh, the development of knowledge is following the very simple model I've indicated is that uh, there are going to be an infinite number of new results possible. So uh, that's of course obvious straight away and might be the most straightforward and obvious answer to my initial question. Of course there is no limit to uh, new things that could be discovered because there are unquestionably an infinite number of true statements in mathematics and there will never be time to write them all down. I don't think that's enormously comforting but I, uh, again I will come back to that right at the end uh, because it keeps getting harder and as I was pointing out for each individual there's going to be less time available in, in achieving the mastery that's required. Of course, the kind of invention that's likely to happen is that the, there will be, sooner or later, there really will be ways of making people's minds, brains more efficient later in life, which would be nice, I would say. Uh, but there's, there's, there are other ways of doing it. I didn't want to totally abandon the thought that there are. Uh, there are other ways of holding at bay the trouble from increased complexity uh, in uh, whatever it is you're trying to do. Computers have certainly helped uh, mathematicians. In other words, you can build a machine which can do your long algebraic calculations for you. Uh, and this has certainly been used quite a lot. Uh, and uh, you can use the computer to check very large numbers of cases, even if it's not a very complicated calculation. There's all that. Uh, maybe I shouldn't mention this to people who are not mathematicians. There's a lot of mathematics that's dreadfully boring because you have to check a lot of individual cases. Uh, not everything comes out with a beautiful general argument pop. Uh, and so we can employ our new slaves, the new sort of imperialism of humans over machines to, to get um, computers to, to do it for us. So the, the, this is all showing the combination of things may be an especially important feature of inventions large and small. And 
So if you think of recent big inventions, or, or what people feel to be big inventions, cell phone, internet, then these, these are very obviously combinations of other things where uh, the, the, the cell phone is just using a lot of things that were available before. Similarly, the, the internet is straightforward transformation of a multi-user computer. Um, but a lot of other inventions were not like that. I have uh, often been a bit puzzled to, to understand quite why uh, if you look at the, the overall process of invention and the creation of new products, which of course is a matter of great interest to economists, how there appears to have been tremendous specialization in the creation of things. The most obvious example, but it's certainly not the only one one could think of, is uh, the movement from fire, fire which provided heat, light, cooking, and it also frightened wild animals away. Uh, and they probably did some other things as well that I haven't bothered to, to think about. So just one, uh, one device did all that. Of course, what happened then was that uh, over a long period of time, you got new devices for lighting, new devices for heating, new devices for cooking, and new devices for keeping the wild animals out. So, uh, and then in fact, it, it's been a kind of con almost continuous progress because there, there was a, a time when light bulbs gave out quite a lot of heat. And uh, I certainly grew up with a coal fire that gave a certain amount of light in, in, in the room uh, uh, as well. Uh, nowadays, of course, central heating gives no light, no help with cooking. Oh, I, I did enjoy uh, toasting crumpets on the stove in my college room in Cambridge. And all, all the, these pleasures have disappeared with the, 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 this specialization. And it must be because to define a specialized goal helps you to get on and do the research. So actually what I find most interesting about the uh, the coming of the cell phone, the internet, and a lot of other aspects of the IT revolution is that uh, for once we seem to have a move away from that specialization. But I suspect that's just uh, for the time being. And then, indeed, it's, it's not a very unexpected combination because you find that Star Trek was talking about it all uh, long before it, it happened. So it was quite easy to, to see. Now before I, uh, I am going to actually show you some numbers and things. I'm actually going to, uh, to, to try to say that there are some things we really could do on the question of how knowledge progresses. Uh, but I think, I think it's important not to be caught up with the notion that when I do that, you feel that I'm really covering the whole range of human knowledge. Because here's a very important sphere of human knowledge that people talking about research and development never talk about. And you'll see, you'll see why. Uh, and I, I regard the arts as very important. That, that they, they really make a big contribution to people's lives in various kinds of ways. So we must take that into account in thinking of uh, the, the progress that new knowledge, that the contribution new knowledge makes to us. Now, you think about things like painting, carving, building, music, literature. In all of these, I think it's fair to say that we want novelty. Uh, mind you, that's something that differs a great deal from person to person. And there's usually a sense that the, the cutting edge artists in whatever field uh, want to create more novelty than most of their consumers uh, want. But at, at any rate, it's a, an essential part of the arts that you have uh, discovery, that's to say, 
creating new things. Uh, I say discovery because you're discovering that you can express things in a different way. You can convey uh, emotions of a perhaps slightly different kind from those that have been conveyed before. You can uh, you, you you find sounds that are new. And these are all an essential part of doing the arts. And at the same time, and of course this doesn't need to be said in China particularly, where the artistic tradition is to try to do nearly as well as old artists did. Uh, and uh, in, in some curious way, the arts have not got any better. Uh, for uh, as long as the, as the record tells us. No matter how far back you go to see examples of art, and of course there aren't very many in the, uh, in the Stone Age, just a few rock drawings and carvings, but the best of them are awfully good. And quite a lot of them. And uh, as you come on later, uh, most people find the, the Odyssey just as good a piece of literature as you'll get today. And of course the point of all this is that the, the fact that you, you, you don't want to claim that there's been progress in the arts doesn't mean that it isn't important that there should be a constant new discovery and advance of knowledge. And that's different from the more material side of things, the science and technology aspect that I'm otherwise talking about. Uh, and I, I wanted to emphasize that because before I get on to some measurement. How fast can knowledge progress? Can we measure knowledge? Well, there, there are some senses in which one can. What economists do is they look at productivity. We try to estimate how much output would have increased from one year to another if there had been no advances in knowledge at all. Well, you might think, how, how can you possibly do that? Well, it's because prices give you some serious information. Uh, the price of labor tells you approximately uh, how, what contribution labor makes to output. Economists call it the marginal product. Similarly, the, the rate of return that people get, the rate of profit they get from investing, the rate of profit on capital, shows you the contribution that extra, an increase in capital can make to output. So you use these things and uh, you can do it in a great detail or you can do it very crudely, approximately. You use these to estimate how much growth of output there would be if there were no advance in knowledge. And then you compare that with how much growth in output actually happened and you treat the difference as a measure of the rate of advance in knowledge. Uh, I had better tell the non-economists here that this is by no means an entirely satisfactory thing in practice. Uh, for example, there was a, a, a period of a few years in America, back in the 70s, when doing this exercise, uh, as, as well as one could, came up with a negative amount of progress. And now you would think that uh, it's impossible for the, the rate of knowledge accumulation to be negative. Uh, you could imagine people forgetting like mad and uh, things deteriorating, but uh, you don't think that that's what happened. So the measurements are definitely inaccurate. However, uh, economists have been trying to do this more and more carefully, and I think we're getting some interesting pictures. Now, of course, there are many countries. So you say, well, which country should you do? Well, the obvious idea is that uh, America will be on what we call the production frontier. It will be making as much use of new inventions, ideas as possible. 
So you would get a measure of the rate at which knowledge is advancing. And this is knowledge in a narrow sense. Now perhaps you see why I excluded the, I talked about the arts just now. I wanted you to realize that it didn't include anything for the advance of the arts. So you're, you're certainly not including everything. And there's something else it's not going to include either, which I will come to afterwards. But we, can, we get something. We get an intriguing picture. What I've done here is to take something from, <clears throat> uh, actually appears in several papers. This is one way that people produce so many papers. They write several papers with the same things in them. And Robert Gordon does this, but he's a very good economist, so I'm not, I shouldn't complain. Um, I, I need to pause for a moment so that you understand quite what's in this picture. You can see it run, well maybe you can see it, it runs from 1948 to, to now, to 2010 actually. And uh, I, I know we've got the various colored things. The, the green line, all three of the colored lines, red, blue, and green, start more or less together. The green line is, uh, if I understand right, the, what actually happened, pretty much. Uh, so something was done in this data to avoid being fooled by the recession, which uh, means that you don't produce all the output that you could, and therefore hides the true information. The blue line is where you would have got to if things had continued the way they'd gone from 1948 to 1973. Uh, and uh, I, I ought to be clear on, on what it is that's going on there. The, this is, uh, in fact, it's the, the log of productivity. And when he says multi-factor productivity there, he, he means taking account of all the various inputs in the, in the sense that I indicated roughly. So just interpret it as a measure of the level of knowledge. That's what we're seeing here. Uh, this is knowledge increasing. And the blue line is the way knowledge would have increased if it had continued to increase at the same rate it was increasing. 1948-73, or at least that's the interpretation I would put on it, and it is also the interpretation that Robert Gordon would, would give. The green line is more what happened. Um, no, no, the green line is the 1973-95 trend. So you can see that something much lower is happening, and red is the, is the actual thing. Now it's true there is a, a, a slight improvement of actual over the trend later on. But the striking feature there is that you're, you're then getting a, a much lower growth rate. And uh, this already makes it look as though the progress of knowledge is, uh, is slowing down. Uh, is that right? Well, of course, Maybe America is not going to be the frontier. Maybe it has already stopped being the frontier. Uh, it's not the richest country in output per head now. But of course, the, the richer ones are uh, rather special cases, like uh, Singapore, or uh, Qatar, or Norway. So, so you can't quite uh, reckon them to be uh, in, in the same league. But uh, certainly looking forward, you wouldn't expect America to be this, the knowledge frontier in quite the same way. Uh, will new knowledge be generated and used elsewhere? Of course it will. Uh, Japan already produces more patents per head per year than the USA. So the last figures I saw was it was producing about three times as many. So, uh, and, uh, people haven't been giving Japan quite the credit they should for the extent to which it is now generating new knowledge 
rather than uh, simply using the knowledge that it used to import in such large amounts from the West. And of course China now has as many patents, not per head of course, but as many patents as the US practically. Uh, mind you, scientists I've talked to say they're not as good but, as the American patents, but we shall see what the results are. Uh, however, the key point is that the ideas are still available to the US and vice versa. Uh, there are the stickiness, uh, it, it may be a bit expensive to use the most up-to-date knowledge, but that, that's a question of who gets the benefit rather than uh, uh, what you would use. So really the different countries ought to increasingly to be using the same technologies. Uh, but they are certainly not all advancing at the, the same kind of rate, but I decided not to get into that. Uh, one possibility as to uh, why the picture looked the way it did there in that previous slide with uh, this uh, falling off. I mean, this is quite a long period, but uh, from a very long historical view, it's not that long a period. We may be waiting just for another new big idea, like the, the breakthrough in computers earlier on. Uh, and uh, these very big ideas uh, and new advances that lead to all kinds of further consequences happen only relatively rarely, even nowadays with uh, uh, thousands, um, hundreds of thousands of scientists. Uh, the other thought, though, which goes the other way, is that the last two centuries have been rather exceptional. Uh, and uh, we may be unwise to think that, uh, that this exceptional period of increasingly rapid growth uh, and increasingly rapid growth of knowledge, perhaps, uh, are anything but exceptional. It's equally possible that uh, we might go back to what it was in the Middle Ages, although, uh, how, how can I say? Well, what I want to, to do next is to look at, a, a, I beg your pardon for the spelling, but uh, sometimes one's fingers get lazy. An encouraging example. Well, we'll see what you think. Uh, the productivity figures I was talking about don't, for example, really allow for uh, advances in, in medicine or any of the things that help health, particularly. Um, and by the way, there's a lot that they leave out which goes the other way, like deterioration of the environment, which uh, I, I don't, won't try to get into now. So what about health? What can we say about that? Uh, in, in many ways, I think uh, life expectancy might be one of the best indicators of human well-being and therefore a very good idea in, in trying to see how things have been going to see how that has happened. Now it's true that more and more money is spent on health over time as well and it's possible that that does truly contribute to uh, improvements in life expectancy. Of course people know that uh, life expectancy tends to improve. But um, I, uh, it, it seems very likely that the improvement is largely due to advances in knowledge. Uh, that, that's not just medical knowledge. It may be that uh, people are better at looking after themselves that uh, you would expect this would be a big contribution from education that people will be told about things. So it's partly the better spread of knowledge that maybe that, that's doing it. But uh, we still have to say, well, why exactly did it improve and how much? Well, here again, we, in, in trying to see what's the best, you'd think take the best country as the frontier and that's of bigger countries, Japan. 
Here's a detailed picture which I got from a interesting paper by uh, an epidemiologist, uh, fairly recent. Um, sorry it's small, but it's, it's enough, for, I'm, I'm going to tell you enough that will make it all vividly clear to you. Right. For the moment, concentrate on the top bits. Uh, you can uh, see this bit going up there with uh, yellow, that's Japan. So th this is what happened to life expectancy 1970 to 2009. And uh, for much of the time, it's pretty straight line for both men and women. It's true Japan had a big improvement at the beginning of the period, where, whereas most of the other countries didn't particularly have that improvement. That's why you've got so many lines on the picture. They're for different countries. And actually, the point of the paper was in many ways to draw attention to the lower lines. The, you're wondering who's at the bottom, which probably most of you can't possibly read. I don't know whether, uh, can anyone guess? Hmm? Eastern European countries Russians. Yes, very good. <laughs> Somebody who knows this stuff, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, the presumption is that in that case it's, uh, it's supposed to be alcoholism. And, uh, <laughs> what's that, that? I don't know. If that, uh, at any rate, that was certainly the view of the, the writer of the paper. But it's the top bit that interests me because that's uh, a sign of very notable uh, progress, which I take to be advance in knowledge. There are really amazingly straight lines at the top. That, that was uh, uh, actual length life expectancy. What does it mean? Life is on average two months longer if you're a year younger. That's more than a day a week. Uh, it's probably more like a day and a half a week. Uh, it's been going on for a while. Uh, your children should live uh, five years longer than you. And probably you'll live at least five years longer, on average, than your parents. Uh, but how long will it go on? Well, I thought, hmm, that paper didn't go back beyond uh, the 70s. So I wanted to see, so I just looked up the USA. Uh, life expectancy of about 50 in 1910, 67 in 1960, 78, 2010. That's averaging men and women this time, of course. Now that, that's two 50-year periods, so you can see it was a 17-year increase in the first 50-year period and an 11-year increase in the second 50-year period. Suppose it goes on like that. Okay, 17, 11, what's the next number in the sequence? How about 5? It gets you to 0 or below 50 years after that. So actually on that basis, it would be perfectly reasonable. To, it's probably the most reasonable prediction from, from all of this is to say that uh, in 2060, things will peak. It might be impossible to get any further advances uh, under 85. It's probably rather less than, than, than most people who've looked into this expect. Well, it's a pretty weak basis on which to make any projection. But it's kind of hard to avoid. I, I, of course, I, I presume that by then Russia will be much transformed and, and Eastern Europe. But uh, the, the frontier, I think, even here, the evidence seems to be towards a slowdown. So why do I really think progress and knowledge might stall? Uh, it seems to me as though knowledge can continue to progress. Uh, and the only reasonable claim, and uh, of course it's only one possibility amongst many, is that it'll progress more and more slowly on average. 
However, that, that wouldn't mean that it stalled. That wouldn't mean that it stopped. So this is where the gloomy economist comes in. Says, well, hmm, I suppose research uh, is costly. That's back to that uh, anecdote I started with about the, the letter from European Nobel scientists asking for more money. Uh, but they wanted money in order to, to do research. So it would then be at some stage if progress gets slow enough, uh, no matter how you value the progress, and I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, you've got to look at that's the economic value alone. Maybe what you're really interested in is, is, is still things like whether there are uh, intelligent beings on planets out in outer space. It's entirely conceivable, you see, that if progress gets slower and slower, that you reach a point where it doesn't pay to go on. Uh, it appears to be very likely to happen in physics because it's getting more and more expensive to, to try each further energy level. Although there have been some uh, ingenious ways of getting around it. I do expect that some people will still be curious and prepared to do research for nothing. And that seems to me the hope for continuing the progress of knowledge. I would happily uh, continue doing research for nothing. So there we are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sir James, for giving us a very, very exciting talk. Uh, we, we have been talking about promoting more conversation between the two General Education Foundation courses, uh, which are entitled uh, In Dialogue with Nature and In Dialogue with Humanity. And this is certainly one of the talks that uh, promote that kind of dialogue because, uh, well, just now I was, uh, when I introduced Sir James, I was too focused on some anecdotes, but uh, uh, some of you may not be aware before uh, Sir James uh, became an economist, he was actually a mathematician. So, so just now we have uh, really look at uh, the measurement of knowledge or the progress of knowledge, so to speak, uh, from the point of view of science as well as uh, the arts. And uh, as somebody in the arts, I, I was most impressed with uh, your observation about how we cannot measure uh, development in the arts by looking at progress, but you know how, how we while we, we should not uh, talk about progress, we still expect new discoveries to go on, uh, particularly for, for students who have taken a course in dialogue with humanity. Uh, I, I guess you, your heart was, you, you know, uh, jumped with delight when Sir James mentioned that the Odyssey, uh, though from so many years ago may still be equally good and I would say even better <laughs> than any piece of literature today but still uh, we, we, we believe there are uh, there is uh, development uh, new discoveries in the arts um, so uh, I, I was just kind of wrapping up ideas that Sir James uh, 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 proposed just now. So now the floor is open to all. Do you have any questions for Sir James? Yeah. Um, a, a question that has bothered me for a very long time. Um, you mentioned the example of mathematics and uh, I want to just, uh, ask how you think about uh, humanities and social sciences in general. Uh, because um, when I was uh, undergraduate uh, doing the PPE degree, we had to read a lot of stuff uh, from 17th century or 19th century Greek thinkers like uh, John Stuart Mill or René Descartes, the French philosopher, and their books we had to study. Of course, as undergraduate students, uh, we were lazy, 
So sometimes we study second-hand material. Uh, papers published by modern scholars on their books, on their thoughts, usually criticism. And those journal publications, those papers, usually contain a long list of citations at the end. The interesting thing I, I, I find out at that time, uh, which I still do not understand today, is that uh, why is it that uh, people could publish so many things with footnotes, whereas the original things that they criticize or that they look into usually uh, are books without footnotes at all. Um, I, I remember I came across uh, this book uh, by Rousseau uh, on social contract, and that's the, uh, uh, there's a book uh, without not, the, not much footnote. There's some references in, inside the book, which I didn't understand, about examples in Greek or in Roman times. And now I wonder, probably in those days, in Greek and Roman times, people did not write books or papers with any footnotes at all, because there was nothing earlier that they could refer to, right? So I wonder, the question is, uh, is this kind of footnote culture uh, signifying that we are actually making less progress these days, because we are only uh, regurgitating, you know, uh, regurgitating on things that have been produced in the past, I have to say economics is perhaps different, because uh, we didn't have to uh, do a lot of uh, uh, reading in Keynes or, uh, or Adam Smith's. Uh, rather, we read uh, those modern journal papers, uh, uh, a few of which I guess are published uh, by you, uh, <laughs> information you asymmetry. No. Uh, actually, uh, we, we read uh, maybe third-hand materials, uh, commentary <laughs> on your papers. Anyway, the point I wish to make is this, uh, so I don't understand. Uh, does this show that uh, actually uh, because human affairs pretty much remain the same, therefore we're not, much, uh, we're not making a great deal of uh, progress or uh, what you said, improvement in these arts or humanities uh, and uh, social sciences subjects? And uh, secondly, uh, is it also because um, the footnote culture itself that is stifling uh, progress? Because uh, in the days of uh, Descartes, uh, he didn't have to you know, spend all his time making our footnotes. Therefore, he could uh, really uh, just sit next to fireplace and just uh, thought, you know, uh, with his thought, uh, came up with all those uh, new ideas, uh, just like uh, out of nothing, uh, and with all those, those things like the Cartesian geometry and things like that, when he was actually looking on, on the wall. So that's actually quite a, a frustration to me as a, as a, 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 as a humanities student. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, that, that's a very interesting observation. Uh, I was just thinking how uh, another of the Enlightenment period, Gibbon, was very famous for his footnotes and decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But of course, then I realized that's because he was writing. Uh, about the Roman Empire, so he had to refer to the, the authors of that, of that period. Uh, so at a, a rather mundane level, that's part of the, the answer to what you're saying. Some, some things were starting new, uh, and some of it is, is that uh, Rousseau was probably not the kind of chap to mention it if he got some ideas from somewhere else. Uh, at least nobody seemed to like him very much, so I suppose. <laughs> um, but then I, then I was, uh, I, I don't know, this is, I think it's probably a good idea to, to use it. I don't, can you hear? Okay. Um, Oh. <laughs> right. uh, it, uh, I, I was indeed contemplating exactly this situation today when I was looking at some economics papers in, in this area. Because certainly the number of uh, papers referred to has gone up quite a lot. Of course, the, the major reason for that is that uh, you really do have to give credit to, to other people uh, or, or 
offend them. Uh, and it's difficult to do this completely. The, the problem of plagiarism is more and more troubling. Uh, and this is partly a defense. It's partly to stop yourself from plagiarizing unconsciously. That uh, It's all part of the, the academic principle that you, you have to show whatever you got from somewhere else. But I am uneasily, for, for me, this is a very genuine trade-off that you referred to. Uh, on, on the one hand, I could spend a lot of time reading what people have written about something I'm thinking about. Um, or, or I could think about it myself. Uh, and uh, like many economists, I think I, I tend to think um, if I couldn't have thought of it myself, then uh, it's probably wrong. I mean, uh, I, I don't intend to be uh, 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 boastful about that. On the contrary, it's rather that uh, I think in terms of basic ideas, economics is, is not so hard that you, you think you're going to find somebody, an economist, with, with some argument that you completely hadn't thought of. It happens from time to time. But I think... It, uh, but, so, so that means you could do it either way. You, 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 you probably wouldn't lose anything in terms of advancing knowledge if you were to just think it out yourself. As far as the theoretical as part of the subject goes. But uh, of course the, the empirical side matters a lot. To, uh, to get tables uh, that then uh, it does genuinely save time to find the, the pictures that other people have created and the tables that they've put together rather than al always to put them together yourself from, uh, from the basis. But you, it was the, the former you were really interested in. And I was just reflecting, I've read a number of Oxford philosophers and I didn't think they had an awful lot of references most of them. So, yes, Austin didn't, uh, or Ryle. But they do refer a bit, but, but it's not like scientific papers or economics papers with, uh, or a historian's work. So, so I, mean, I think you raise a very interesting problem that people have, where increasingly you have to pay attention to other people's work, because otherwise you will offend them and the academy generally, rather than because you need it for uh, the advance of knowledge. And I talked as you always need to go and find out what everybody else has done. Uh, I think that was an exaggeration. Uh, uh, I think that that was certainly a very good question and you won a big applause from, lo from lo lots of young faces here because uh, I, I and my colleagues are coercing them into, <laughs> into uh, uh, making references and using footnotes. Um, but, but I would say that uh, in the case of Descartes or a lot of uh, those thinkers, uh, would it be right to put it this way, that they are actually conversing directly to previous thinkers? But whereas when we are writing papers, we are not conversing with previous thinkers. We don't expect them to read our papers, but we are actually having a conversation with each other. So that would probably be yeah, a key yes, difference. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's true. Yes. Uh, Sir, Sir James, I would like to ask a question. How do you think about capitalism? And as we know, the, the environment and the carrying, carrying capacity of the Earth is finite. And how much more GDP growth can we still afford? And how much within a limited system, let's say dependent Earth, how much economic growth, which is, as some economists may say, this is unlimited, how much can we, we to sustain this kind of development? Thank you. Now, what I probably didn't emphasize sufficiently is that one thing is clear, there's an awful lot still to be found out. And one of the things that I think is extremely hard to get any handle on is just how far we can get making much less use 
of uh, damaging resources. I'm thinking of oil, particularly. Although it's not the only example of something with, uh, with very, very bad effects. Uh, for the time being, we can keep growing fine using it. It's not that uh, there's any serious shortage of these things. Uh, we are understanding the, the physics and chemistry of these things. We've got all this energy coming in from the sun all the time. So it's not that there's go ever going to be a shortage of energy that we need for all, all the kinds of things. But it's clear that a world that operates uh, using only green sources of power will look very different from the, the world that we're in now. Uh, though I, I really don't see, uh, in the, the largest sense, much reason not to think that that could also be a world with a very much higher GDP than, than the one we have. Uh, I mean, for example, even now, photovoltaic cells, which admittedly use other kinds of material which will eventually be in short supply, uh, are, are beginning to, to be much cheaper to, to operate. Uh, that still might mean that we have to spend our nights sleeping because there's no electricity available until daylight comes. But uh, uh, I, I think there are a lot, lots of possibilities for green development. But equally, I think we're a long way from it. You did start by saying, how about capitalism? Uh, which has a hint in it that maybe the capitalist institutions and, and property ownership uh, and the kinds of interests that they create, I mean that the, the particular e economic and therefore political interests of the owners of these resources may prevent exactly the kinds of Technical, technological development that would be needed. Uh, and if so, it, that, that could indeed lead, probably on a time horizon of uh, about 100 years, to, to real problems. Uh, and, and I'm not even prepared to say that I think that's unlikely. But I certainly think capitalism can survive Uh, Professor Milley, I have a question so regarding the, um, the possibility of new uh, development or growth. Um, you mentioned quite a number of uh, areas uh, like art and, uh, you know, um, and iPhone and all the others. But, um, and also you mentioned we have right now two million uh, 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 types of um, patents, patents. But then, you know, the, uh, the the problem is, if we uh, the, uh, the problem is in the application. I think you know if we think about the applications. There should be a lot of area you know that we can uh, develop. Say for example, I remember when I was young. Now I'm retired. When I was young, people t tell me don't go to the sunset industry. So I asked them, uh, what what sun what sunset industry? He said it's textile. But now, you know, textile, they have, you, you look at this textile industry, they are still surviving. And more and more new machine, new technology, coating, you know, it's, it's coming. So the point is the application of technologies on sunset industries. And then we'll make the industry become sunrise. So, so and you mentioned about combination. So if, if uh, we combine the knowledge not to develop new theory, but to develop new application, then, you know, just uh, imagine mathematics, a combination of, you know, C, N to the power, uh, or P, N to the power X, then the N is two million, then how many permutation will it be? That is, how many possibility will it be? Uh, 
Right enough, uh, part of the point of mentioning the two million is that uh, uh, it, it must make you wonder uh, wh where have they all gone, as it were. Uh, I mean, it obviously wasn't as high as that. It, it suggests that, uh, I, I suppose, seven years ago there would have been a million. So, uh, I mean, the, the sheer number of patents that have been registered by now is unbelievably large. Uh, and yet, if we were to sit down and make a kind of account of the, uh, of the inventions we were aware of, it'd be quite a long list, but it wouldn't be remotely of that order of magnitude, uh, which is, uh, and uh, I think one has to conclude, uh, and there are lots of examples to, to support it, that, that most inventions are of no value. Uh, however, uh, interesting point about Sunset Industries, I, I, th I think that this whole issue of how technical progress goes on in different industries is indeed very interesting and uh, people have done a lot on that. Uh, and you get uh, very, very different rates of advance in the different industries. Uh, this is perhaps most clear in the energy industries where um, apparently, uh, according to what people are supposed to be expert in this field, that uh, coal has not got any more efficient, been no, no technical advance there for, for a long time. Although, of course, uh, uh, coal remains the, the cheapest energy source, unfortunately. But uh, whereas um, oil uh, has, was advancing quite significantly for a while, and then you've got these uh, new, some of the new technologies doing very well. Of course, nuclear power not, not improving. So you, you just get big differences, and it, it, it seems to me that the big differences between the, the ones that are doing rapidly and the ones that uh, aren't going anywhere in terms of, of new advances doesn't seem to be particularly to do with sunset, sunrise, uh, uh, you know, new, newly fashioned things like uh, IT or, or very old things like, um, like rice. Um, you, you, could, you, you have the possibilities of, of advance anywhere, which I think is part of what you're saying. But I think it's also very striking when uh, you look at the, the data, that in a lot of industries there is practically no advance. But also in a lot of industries there is practically no research, I mean, practically no patents. Just as in a lot of countries there's practically no, no invention. I mean, in Greece there's very few patents per, per year. So, which is strange after. They, they did it all back in the classical times, I suppose. <laughs> I, 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 it's kind of hard to understand why uh, things are so concentrated, but they really are. It's the most striking feature of research and advanced knowledge, how it's concentrated geographically and in particular industries very narrowly. Uh, yes, uh, James, I want to ask, uh, question about the potential new discoveries in economics. Uh, recently, I read an article written by the famous economist, uh, Professor J uh, Justin Yves Ling. And in that article, uh, he said that when he returned uh, to China after receiving his PhD in the University of Chicago, uh, he tried to uh, uh, apply the Western economic theories to explain the economic situations in China at that time. But uh, very soon, he found out that uh, the so-called mainstream theories could not explain uh, many of the economic phenomena in China. So he went on to, de to develop his new theories. But uh, when he uh, developed his own theories, the uh, fundamental pro approach he used uh, is basically that of the uh, mainstream economics. So it seems to me that uh, it seems to me that the economic theories may have two two parts. The first one is the, uh, can be called the general theory of, or the general principles. They can, they can be applicable uh, uh, globally all over the world, uh, more or less. But the uh, second part is the uh, specific theory, 
that is developed to explain the uh, economic situations of particular, particular uh, countries or regions. So my question is, uh, what would the, uh, the new discoveries in uh, science of economics would lie more on the part of the general theory or in the part of the speci specific theory? Um, Thank you. Yes, I, I, mean, I, I, I it, it seems to me that um, Justin Lin goes rather, or Lin Yifu, depending how you wish yeah, yeah. to put it, uh, went too far in that direction, perhaps because one always tends to overvalue one's own uh, uh, account. But it, of course, there was the particular feature, even at the time when he came back to China, I don't actually remember quite when it was. About uh, 1985, I would say. Yes. So the economic reform period had been going on for a little while. Do you, you think that the obvious difficulty of applying uh, existing economic theory, the, the general principles to, yes. uh, to, to China would be that uh, the, if they weren't using prices, like in the period of, uh, up to 1970-78, uh, where uh, you, you really didn't have uh, markets cleared with supply and demand equal to one another. Uh, I didn't mean one couldn't do a lot using the ideas of, of economics, particularly macroeconomics. But, and uh, I think looking back on it now, one can understand a lot of what's going on without getting into the price mechanism. But Chicago was uh, an economic school that concentrated very much on prices. Uh, took very little interest, at least up to that time, in important things like income distribution or, or, or other motivations or the, uh, the, the, like the, the nature of the, what kinds of incentives encourage people to produce more, which turned out to be tremendously important in China. And, and yet, when I say that, I'm also aware uh, that uh, another former Chicago economist who was a professor in Hong Kong, Stephen Chung, wrote uh, papers uh, where incentive contracts of the kind you get with sharecropping, which can very well be understood as uh, the, the way in which Chinese farmers were operating once uh, by 1985. Uh, the, the, that, that was, it seems to me, to be using economic ideas absolutely centrally. But it, it's true there was originality there. It, it's, it's also the kind of thing I'm interested in. It's not like the first year, first term economic theory that most people seem to think of when they, when they talk about economics, but it's still central economic theory. So I, I would need to see in more detail quite what he's claiming. But I, I, I do think that's an overstatement. I think it's the, the, the general principles uh, apply pretty easily to the Chinese system. But that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't lots of important features, just as there are in Britain or America or whatever, which uh, are not encompassed in these general things because you get particular individuals behaving in, in ways, I mean, like finance ministers or, 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 or businessmen who have particular economic interests they wish to pursue that lead to things that you would say shouldn't happen under the standard economic model. All that's true, but, but I think thinking about it is still economics, of course. Thank you. Hi, Professor Mears. Um, I'm a little bit greedy. I want two questions. <laughs> uh, one has to do with um, our day-to-day um, -day life, you know, the connectivity to internet. You know, how do you think the internet, you know, the information that we can access through internet, you know, help or impair our access to knowledge? And another question I want to have is that when you talk about the arts, advancement in the arts, what does that mean? You know, how would you kind of 
maybe illustrate how the so-called advancement in art will help us to kind of acquire more knowledge. I just try to see how, how I can understand that better. Um, yeah, uh, on, that. on the first one, uh, of course, uh, is, uh, it's probably clear. I, I, I got these uh, pictures of the data off the internet. So the internet is a wonderful research tool. It's another thing. Uh, quite separate from the use of computers say, to, to help uh, what you're, you're doing, which provides a kind of amplification. And I, I dare say you could say, because you also asked, then how could it hinder the advance of knowledge? Uh, in a sense, it has to be the same answer I, I'd attempt on, on the problem of all that stuff out there that's written and is relevant. The internet, unfortunately, makes it a lot easier to, uh, to find everything that has been written on a particular problem. Uh, and that is, I, I'm myself not a particularly fast reader, but it, uh, I'm not a fast reader. Even for a fast reader, I think on, on almost any interesting topic, there's going to be too much to read. Uh, and how can you find out which bits of that you really needed to, to know? Um, well, many, many subjects have done a pretty good job of uh, doing physics abstracts of, of the, the, the medical profession. I still find uh, pursuing some things I'm curious about. Let, let me take an example. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know whether the internet hinders here or not, or what, what's going on. But uh, I, I, it, it seemed to me clearly a very important bit of knowledge that needs advanced, is finding out what various treatments in traditional Chinese medicine, how they actually perform on large samples, uh, well, constructed people, analogous to finding out what's the effect of drug, particular pharmaceuticals on, on people. And it, it seems to me surprisingly difficult to find any such studies, say the, the effect of acupuncture, uh, that, are, that then turn out to be of the, the right statistical quality. Now, they must exist. So I'm curious to know why, why doesn't one get at them? And I think one of the things is that, that apparently in that whole sphere, insofar as people are trying to advance knowledge in the area of traditional Chinese medicine, it's as though the, the like, like uh, drug manufacturers in the West, they don't want to publish every, uh, everything that is found. Uh, so maybe I'm just saying that there, there are problems that the internet isn't going to solve rather than problems that the internet creates. But it, it still relies on the willingness of people to put thing, things on it. Uh, that's, it's not something we can easily control as far as I can see. And there are attempts now to get similar evidence in the West on, always on to, uh, available on the internet. Uh, but uh, there are clearly interests that, that go the other way. Uh, sorry, but that uh, was... Uh, uh, and your second question, remind me? Yes. That could go on a long time. Um, it, it might have been rhetorical. Let's say you might have been saying, yeah, but of course it, it doesn't make any sense to, to think of progress in the arts. But, oh, but I think it does, because I really do believe in the quality of, of pieces of art. So, of course, my, my claim was uh, not that we can't talk about progress here. Uh, and I can easily imagine thing, things getting better. Of course, one of the things that happens is that uh, presumably a lot of dud art disappeared. Uh, nobody was interested in preserving it. And um, we possibly lost, well, I know we lost some good stuff too. There's some Monteverdi operas that have gone for good. Um, 
But then there's a lot of dumb stuff around now, isn't there? So, uh, I mean, it really does look as though you don't have that overall progress. And, I, and equally, I wasn't complaining about that. Uh, because uh, fortune, we're, we're very fortunate that there's so many wonderful pieces of art have been created in, in all of these dimensions so that it is actually hard to conceive of anything better than, than the best of them. But it's hard to, uh, and there's so much that it would be nice to get rid of. And, and again, a little bit about all that stuff out there on the web, which is really worth reading. Same kind of thing. Uh, uh, and, uh, it, but it raises a different issue here. That what for me is art I could do without, which is most pop music. I, I equally uh, recognize that there are many people for whom that's much more valuable than the kinds of music I like. And I'm not opposed to that. Uh, and I think that's a very special feature of of the arts, which is not, of course, true of mathematics. Uh, hello, Professor Professor Melodies. I have a I have a f I have a few questions for you. For, first of all, it, one thing one thing you alluded to in the course of this lecture was how, was the communication in between the disciplines, despite the adv the advent of the internet. I've, in my, in my, in my experience, if, from re, from reading the, cita the citations and re, and what and stuff on the internet and whatnot, the it's that in spite of such of certain over degrees of overlap, it, the communication between them is still very poor. What what would you, what would you, what do you propose to help remedy remedy this? And second, when you were when you were do, thinking, when you were drafting this lecture and presentation, did you disc did you think about including any um, insights from, say, the philosophy of science or the history of science? Thank you. Uh, in a sense, this should be about history of science, but uh, I, yeah, I don't know enough about the history of science. That, that's the, the answer to your writer at, 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 the, at the end. Uh, my column is everybody else. I've read Kuhn, which is fascinating. but. Uh, uh, that, that doesn't tell, it, it, it didn't, didn't seem, so the, the only things I knew about, uh, some of the stuff at LSE, uh, and so on, didn't seem to me to say anything on, on this topic, but uh, maybe it should. An interesting comment you make, yeah. Uh, I, because uh, it's almost taken for granted that uh, more multidisciplinary work must be a good idea, more communication between uh, fields, more work together. Yet many people have the, well, maybe some people, have the impression that a lot of deliberately multidisciplinary work is not actually very good. Uh, and. Uh, uh, years ago, uh, when we were first talking about these kinds of issues, which are very important uh, in economics because economics impinges and uh, needs a lot of cooperation with other fields. But uh, generally speaking, we don't find that very easy. Um, and I, I remember a conversation with an economist uh, Jacques Drez, I admire greatly, would be one of the leading European economists. He, he, he remarked that, in his view, joint multidisciplinary work only works if people share the language of mathematics. And uh, uh, at that time, it seemed very difficult for us to to think up any examples where that, that, that contradicted that. Uh, I mean, for example, economists nowadays have quite a lot of interaction with psychologists and with the psychology literature. Uh, so there's mathematics in a rather general sense. It's where things can be quantified and, uh, and when you turn things into 
equations uh, and so on. So it works there. But I'm aware that, of course, there have been some very big advances which happened after that conversation, or just after. Uh, uh, I think uh, in genetics and all that, where the, the interface between uh, biology and the molecular sciences, chemistry at that time, was, uh, was very, very important. And that uh, people had to get away from the, the narrow separation of the, the subjects. So I, th I think that that is an area where interdisciplinary work seems to prove to be enormously fruitful and, and, and effective. But still, my narrow experience in economics is that uh, it, it's, it's difficult. And, and one of the major reasons why it's difficult is uh, that, that so often people seem to lack respect for the work uh, people are doing in other subjects. Perhaps economists, and it may be only right that it should be so, are particularly subject to that. Uh, because uh, it, it seems that a lot of people, uh, scientists particularly, do believe that if only they had the time, they could clearly do economics a lot better than economists can. Uh, and somehow that's not a good basis for cooperation. Uh, in the, in the, it, they're welcome to try. And I did remark early in the lecture that it so happens that a number of major advances in economics have been made by non-economists. So uh, I, I would even encourage them to try. But I think uh, you, you need a lot of mutual respect when, uh, actually to cooperate effectively. Uh, hello, Sir James. Uh, thank you for your lecture. And um, regarding your last statement of uh, some people may do research for nothing, well, uh, it, it reminds me of uh, mathematics books that I read, uh, come across many years ago. And um, in the preface of that book, well, uh, it refers mathematicians to some people uh, who merely enjoys the process of thinking. And well, uh, they may, may not be solving some problems. They may be just uh, create some mathematical objects. They uh, define the mathematical operations. And then they may be rigorously uh, deduce the theorems and corollaries. And they put all these on the papers. And maybe after, say, 200 years later, and uh, scientists of an other discipline, maybe the, um, uh, maybe the say, uh, finance or maybe uh, biology, maybe well, um, they may meet a problem in their own aspects, and then they will look into the encyclopedia, and they may look uh, from nowadays backward, and maybe um, 10, 10, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when they go to 200 years ago, maybe they say, ah, this, this equation is solved my problems nowadays. So um, maybe mathematics are some science that um, the the effects may not be shown on the society very uh, quickly. Um, the, the saying of 200 years may be a little bit exaggerated. Um, some mathematical advance, like the um, game theory, you know, uh, the game theory of John Nash, and they first published, published this as some mathematical theory, and uh, the people found its application quickly and uh, awarded him the Nobel Prize of economics. And so maybe, for some um, science of the um, of the fundamental of more fundamental, say mathematics or maybe physics or astronomy, maybe some maybe there there is advancement. But if uh, we apply your model of the um, the growth of productivity, um, maybe it, it it cannot reflect the advance uh, very promptly. Um, do, do you agree with this? Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't expect the the rough model that I kind of put there to, to work terribly well. I'm afraid, but uh, it can certainly be uh, in, improved. I, I was. There are many examples, of course, of uh, people in related subjects finding the. 
uh, what mathematicians had done very useful, uh, although they might or might not have uh, developed it with an eye to economics. The, the game theory example is a very interesting one, because of, of course uh, Nash was not the first to develop game theory, that was uh, Jan von Neumann. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he was participating in a seminar with economists, mathematical economists, in, uh, I suppose, Vienna, probably. And he wrote a couple of papers, uh, one, one of which was more obviously about economics than the, the one on two-person games. Uh, and uh, that, that was something that uh, all mathematical economists, at least, knew back in the, in the mid-50s before Nash did, did his work. Uh, indeed, it so happens that uh, when I was a math student at Edinburgh, we were expected in our final year to, to do a lecture about something. So I actually uh, did it on von Neumann's game theory. Uh, so it was something mathematicians were very aware of as well. But the, uh, so I know that uh, von Neumann was doing all this with an eye on economics. So it wasn't just some, something that had been done independently. And Nash, similarly, uh, uh, what, what Nash had done was uh, no doubt to look at uh, von Neumann's work and to say, wouldn't it be interesting to generalize it? And he uh, 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 so that, that's pretty much what he was doing. Uh, so again, it was clearly Nash doing economics. Although at that time, most economists would have said that had nothing to do with economics, but it, when it turned out it was just what they needed for all kinds of things. Uh, and my impression on, on the main, that's how things go. But the, the obvious example would be, uh, this sounds a little technical, but you get the idea. Uh, Einstein trying to develop the theory of general relativity uh, couldn't do it. He was in need of a mathematical language to, to talk about it. And he found that something called tensor calculus had already been developed in mathematics without uh, much of an idea of this. At least this is the account as I, I've heard it. Uh, and, but of course, it had, oh, this goes back to Riemann, really, uh, uh, although we didn't talk about tensors. Um, that there wasn't that much of a gap between the development of these things. And they were developed with an eye on space, even if not thinking about, uh, uh, about it. Now, uh, on the whole, I would expect that's the way it would go. Uh, mathematicians can give you a number of examples. Of, uh, a lot of the development of prime numbers, of course, turned out to be of, of use in cryptology and in, in, in coding messages to be secret. Uh, and that's, uh, the, the, that's perhaps the, the major example of how things can happen totally independently. Uh, but in a way, this is part and answer to the uh, supplement to what I said about the previous question. But I, I, uh, I, I should say also that for cooperation, people really do need to be interested in one another's topics. Not just fields, but quite narrowly. They've got to understand what one another is, is doing. Uh, uh, now that, that's in economics. I know it's obviously not true in uh, particle physics where some people can understand how to, to make things to do the measurements and other people can do quantum theory and the, the, there it seems to be possible to have a bigger division. Maybe one last question. Uh, so James, thank you for your uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I noticed that you mainly mentioned science in the Western tradition, but it may be a good idea to uh, learn from the East, like dealing with the 
uh, uncertainty problem. Another example is that uh, we think we live in a three-dimensional world in Newton's time and a four-dimensional world in Einstein's time. And now scientists say that we are actually living in a 11 dimension world. Um, uh, but I think someday we may admit the Buddha's, um, the Buddha's wisdom that we are actually living in an infinite dimension world. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you think um, our cultural value may have some uh, uh, essential effect on the development of uh, knowledge? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, indeed, you could ask that question about uh, whether, uh, say, r religious or cultural beliefs have an influence on, uh, on Western developments. Um, okay. Examples don't spring to, to my mind immediately. I mean, I thought uh, yours is an interesting one since it somehow seems much more appealing that there should be an infinite number of dimensions all rolled up smaller and smaller rather than that you stop at 11. Uh, and that, that just seems attractive. Uh, but uh, I have, uh, insofar as I'm a scientist rather than a uh, on the art side, uh, which I think is quite a lot. Uh, I've often expressed this by saying, well, you see, what, what uh, people in the arts don't understand, uh, if, they, if you talk about a theory to them or, or a piece of science, they, they, they want to know what made you think that or, or, or uh, how will it influence people. Uh, and uh, the scientists just want to know whether it's true. Uh, and, and what else it might uh, lead to. Uh, and so, so in, in some ways, I, I think that there are, there are reasons why culture is not, not all that likely to influence science, but it's perfectly legitimate to, to ask and explore these questions, which you could certainly do within Chinese culture as well, because there have been a lot of inventions developed in, in, in China. Uh, and since people have been very fascinated for a long time with the puzzle as to why China's, uh, I, th I think it must be fairly spectacular uh, growth at one time just stopped so that when Adam Smith was writing his Wealth of Nations, he, he, he said China had reached the stationary state. And uh, essentially the reason was because it didn't have the, the, the conditions of, uh, of the West. And he claimed that uh, once it had the, the sort of uh, political and, and legal arrangements of the of the West, that then it, it could grow, grow again, which has turned out to be true. But you might not accept that that's a good description of what happened. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I do think communism is a very Western kind of uh, thing. Well, thank you very much again, Professor Sir James. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to contribute the cultivation of respect for people doing other disciplines, I think conversations like this would certainly be among them. And uh, this is the, the last of the series of talks uh, for this term uh, on um, uh, intellectual pursuits in our lives and today we have uh, a social scientist uh, reflecting on the pursuit of knowledge and how knowledge can progress or not progress but still you know uh, continue to develop new perspectives uh, actually in the uh, last few talks we also have the perspectives uh, uh, 
of uh, you know similar similar reflections uh, you know from from a scientist and uh, also from somebody who has done years of research uh, in literature. So you are welcome to go online, and if you went here uh, the last few weeks, you, you are welcome to go online and review those video recording, and thereby maybe together we will cultivate this mutual respect uh, for what each other uh, is doing and maybe contribute to the development of knowledge in the future. So again, thank you very much, Professor Sir James Lewis. Good night and thank you for coming. Well, thank you for the occasion. Thank you very much.